Hello and a very warm welcome to the Money Controls Pre-Budget Economist Roundtable. I am Shweta Punj. Budget 24-25 is set to be presented on July 23rd. This budget com comes against an interesting backdrop. The first one of a coalition government, but more than that, it comes after BJP's loss in some of its traditional strongholds in the general elections. The BJP is looking at state elections in Haryana and Maharashtra this year and Delhi and Jharkhand in January next year. So will the budget be more of the same or will this be a budget with a dash of socialism, populism, politics and prudence? We are hoping to get some answers today as we debrief and completely decode the Indian economy, the pulls and pressures that uh, Ms. Sita Raman is facing today as she, play, as she presents the budget next week. Joining me right now is uh, Mr. D.K. Srivastava, Chief Policy Advisor, EY India, and Ms. Aditi Nair, Chief Economist and Head of Research and Outreach, ICRA, and Mr. Gaurav Chaudhary, Consulting Editor at Network 18, right here with me in the studio. Thanks so much uh, to all our panelists for joining us. Let me begin uh, with you, Mr. Srivastava. You, uh, you always call it out as you see it. What, according to you, are the big challenges, the big pulls and pressures that are that should that ought to be weighing on the mind of Ms. Sita Raman as she presents the budget uh, on Tuesday? Well, I think she will have to address the question as to whether to maintain the fiscal consolidation uh, path that was announced in the interim budget, or whether she will relax on the expansion of revenue expenditure because uh, there are uh, signals that uh, private sector demand as well as government demand is weak and the rural sector requires considerable support employment issues are gathering uh, momentum in terms of the uh, discussions that are going on so the whole issue can be addressed in terms of the fact that the finance minister will have whether she will have additional room as compared to the interim budget in terms of available revenues. Now, our sense is that the nominal GDP growth could be as much as 11% as compared to last year's, that is FY24's 96 okay. And this is because we expect a real GDP growth in the range of 7 to 7.2%. Mm -hmm. And the implicit price based deflator could be close to 3.6, 3.7. That would give us uh, about 11% nominal GDP growth. Mm -hmm. Even if we apply a buoyancy of 1.1, it will give in terms of net tax revenues available to the central government something like additional 40,000 crore. Okay. Now, in terms of the additional RBI dividend, we might have another 1 lakh crore. So, something like 1.4 to 1.5 lakh crore would be the additional revenues available to the finance minister. And then that has to be allocated in terms of uh, additional revenue growth, mm -hmm. capital growth sustained or additional growth in capital expenditure also and maintaining fiscal consolidation target. My sense is that fiscal consolidation target will be maintained at 5.1 as announced in the interim budget. Right. Capital expenditure growth at 17% was there. It might be maintained or mar marginally augmented. Mm -hmm. But it is the revenue expenditure that will grow from 4.6 to something like close to 8%. That difference will accommodate a lot of uh, relaxation in terms of uh, providing for additional uh, support to rural demand. Hmm. Uh, interesting points there, uh, uh, Mr. Srivastava. It does seem like uh, while there might be uh, challenges that uh, Ms. Sitaraman is facing, but the, this revenue surplus that she's looking at uh, could could really act as a buffer. Aditi, I wanted to get your thoughts in on this. Uh, uh, what, according to you, would be the key challenges uh, that uh, the budget will have to factor in? Thanks, Vita. So, you know, uh, broadly calculations are quite similar to what uh, Mr. Srivastav just laid out. Uh, we're looking at a revenue upside of 1.2 trillion after setting off the extra taxes that will have to be shared with the states. Uh, so, 1.2 trillion is what, uh, uh, you know, the headroom that uh, we have, uh, which uh, the government needs to figure out uh, whether uh, to use it for revenue expenditure, capital expenditure, or uh, hopefully some faster uh, fiscal consolidation. So, the sense that we have is that uh, 
uh, we already had a pretty steep ask, a uh, 17% growth in uh, CapEx on a large base. And as had been uh, expected, uh, the capital expenditure has been really uh, sluggish during the parliamentary election uh, time. And we've seen a 14% contraction in April, May in YOY terms. Uh, progressively, as we move forward, by the time the budget is presented and passed, uh, we are still going to be in the middle of the monsoon season. So the head, uh, you know, time available to actually uh, spend this uh, capex uh, is not as uh, much as it is in normal years. It is curtailed in this election year. And uh, in any case, within the headroom uh, that uh, the within the target that had been set uh, in the interim budget for capital expenditure. 70,000 crore was kind of a placeholder. It had not actually been allocated to any ministry and that's what we're expecting will now, of course, come through uh, in the final budget. So the sense I have is that it may not be very fruitful to increase the headline amount of capital expenditure. Of course, the 70,000 crore will get redistributed between the different ministries and that will give up give a bump up to the individual uh, ministry's uh, budget allocations. Uh, so the revenue upside then needs to be shared between uh, either revenue expenditure or faster fiscal consolidation. And uh, my sense is that uh, splitting it equally between the two would be a, a good way to go in the current year. So increasing revenue expenditure by about uh, 50, 60,000 crore. Basically, we've had a very high growth here last year in terms of the headline GDP numbers. But consumption growth uh, was just about 4%. And in fact, consumption growth, uh, CAGR over the last five, six years has also been just around uh, 4%. So we've got high consumption growth, high sentiment in some pockets, but other pockets uh, seem to be lagging as far as their uh, demand and their uh, sentiment is concerned. So it might be appropriate to use this extra revenue expenditure to really push up uh, you know, uh, the uh, spending and the, um, uh, you know, sentiment of uh, the segments where consumption has been lagging over the last year. And one thing which obviously comes to mind is uh, the rural economy, which has struggled with a very uneven monsoon uh, last year. So higher rural spending uh, through revenue expenditure would be um, quite likely in the upcoming budget. And uh, if we spend 50% of the revenue upside on that, that still gives us about 60,000 crore left over for faster uh, fiscal consolidation. So we're looking at a fiscal deficit being actually paired to 4.9 to 5% of GDP uh, in the full budget for FY25. And that should give us, uh, you know, a lower borrowing in H2 uh, to the okay. tune of 35 to 55,000 crore. All right. Okay. Uh, let me also bring in Gaurav here. Gaurav, you've heard the two economists and, uh, you know, I introduced the show saying that this budget is coming with a very interesting backdrop because this is not a, a BJP led majority that's presenting the budget. So there is this pressure from the allies that's very clearly there. And then you have, uh, you have uh, other considerations like uh, a tepid rural demand. You have agriculture, which is uh, showing a slowdown, a very substantial slowdown. So, um, you know, if if you were to uh, give us perspective on how uh, uh, the, the balancing act that this budget will have to do, what according to you are the key levers that Ms. Sita Raman will have to accelerate on uh, in this budget? No, no, thanks, Shweta. See, a couple of things. Uh, I mean, uh, the conditions uh, that were present on February 1 and the conditions that are present now, there are a few things that are very different. For instance, uh, you mentioned about the political landscape. Uh, while it's not uh, spectacularly different, but there is still a lot of difference from the, you know, from the perch at, at North Block, from which uh, Ms. Sita Raman now sees the world, is very different from what you, uh, she saw uh, on February 1, uh, so far as the political landscape is concerned. But there's another thing also on the fiscal side. Uh, is also about uh, there is some more elbow room that now she enjo enjoys which was not visible in February which is of course the large part of that is because of the RBI dividend. Uh, if you look at the interim budget the numbers of the RBI from the RBI div dividend mm. that the government had estimated was about 1 lakh crore. Uh, actual numbers actually turned out to be 2.1 lakh crore uh, yes. which is going to be factored into this financial FY25, so that's a, that's a big elbow room. Uh, there's also a bit of little bit of more tax buoyancy that is now visible, uh, mm. which was not visible in February, uh, mm. going by the first quarter numbers. Uh, mm. I think that is something that's going to make her far more comfortable, given the fact that it pulls in pressures uh, mm. for some more welfare spending to come along. Mm. But on the on the uh, on the point of revenue expenditure that both uh, the panelists have raised, uh, uh, I would expect the revenue expenditure to go up a little bit more. 
uh, as a as a percentage of total expenditure. And if you if you do a uh, if you know if you do a time series analysis since FY. 18 mm -hmm. revenue expenditure which was at about 87 percent more than 87 percent of total expenditure uh, has significantly come down to in the interim budget it was about 76.7 percent mm -hmm. uh, i expect that to go up uh, upwards of about 77 percent mm -hmm. uh, having said that i wouldn't be surprised if actually in the in the final budget that's going to be presented on july 30 uh, july 23rd mm -hmm. the finance minister actually lowers the fiscal deficit target from 5.1 percent that was projected in interim budget to about five percent of gdp in the final budget Hmm. So interesting, interesting thoughts in there, uh, Gaurav. Uh, let me uh, let me bring in uh, uh, Mr. Shivastav here. Let me bring in Mr. Shivastav and uh, Aditi on this. So, so clearly there is a rural consumption that's lagging. Private investment has not picked up. We've been hearing uh, a lot about this whole employment debate. Uh, you know, the other day there was this video that went viral where lakhs of applicants turned up for some uh, job openings at Air India. So there are uh, there are a lot of real issues, and there are also a lot of optics at play. So. Uh, from what what we are picking up and what we've been discussing that there will be a lot of focus on welfare spending i want to come across to the sources of revenue do you see disinvestment coming back on the agenda uh, mr shivastav yes i think there would be some additional contribution that can be expected in terms of the uh, budget estimates that may be provided as mm -hmm. coming from uh, the non tax and non debt receipts and there would be some additional amount that may be provided on the on, on the side of dis disinvestment. Hmm. Uh, on the whole, I think the uh, pressure on expanding revenue expenditure would be far more uh, palpable as compared to the incentive to reduce fiscal deficit, further as uh, uh, in comparison to what was announced. So my sense is that 5.1 may be maintained. Of course, it will be very welcome if if they can announce a medium-term adjustment path for fiscal consolidation and take it to 3.5 or 3% 3 in the next 3 to 4 years. So in terms of signaling and in terms of what the rating agencies may like to hear, uh, India would be uh, uh, targeting a... Uh, a restoration of the fiscal consolidation target of 3% as far as the union government is concerned in the next three to four years. But I think the FM has also to make sure that the signals are such that foundations are laid for a solid medium term uh, growth path for India. Uh, and that may be more than 100% of the global growth path average. And therefore, uh, emphasis will be there on uh, committing to expanding capital expenditure as long as private investment does not pick up, as long as global growth does not pick up. And then within that, those two contours of uh, a fiscal consult, medium term fiscal consolidation path and a medium term path for ex infrastructure expansion. For the immediate term, I think additional revenue expenditures would definitely be provided for. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, let me also now welcome uh, Rajat Sethi who is joining us. He is a political economist uh, with uh, very heavy leanings towards the BJP. Uh, before I come to you Rajat, let me quickly get uh, Aditi's thoughts in. Aditi, we just heard Mr. Shivastav that disinvestment might be back on the table and for the last one year we would heard the government say that they don't want to rush into disinvestment. There should be a proper strategy to get maximum value. But considering that there could be an increased push towards spending on welfare, increased spending on a, 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 a whole host of schemes that uh, have a spillover effect on rural demand. Uh, do you see divestment and asset monetization picking up steam? Also, what according to you should the government do to ensure that you know these targets are not just targets on paper and that they are actually met? So, Shweta, few, uh, you know, things on the topic of disinvestment. Uh, firstly, I don't expect it to pick up steam immediately. Uh, I think uh, if there is going to be a couple of new 
big ticket social sector schemes that get announced uh, this year or next year and that creates a lot of ongoing revenue pressure then perhaps uh, you know disinvestment uh, uh, may be thought of uh, at a later point in time however right now i don't think that uh, the government is going to include a significantly higher target for disinvestment uh, in this year's uh, budget itself now uh, you know couple of other uh, uh, points uh, on this putting in a high disinvestment number uh, up front which uh, doesn't you know to toward which we don't see progress in the first few months of fiscal year typically leads to a lot of doubts uh, from uh, market participants uh, about the overall fiscal deficit target being met and in situations like that we've seen that the yields start inching up because uh, the bond market starts uh, uh, you know really second guessing uh, whether a miss on disinvestment is going to lead to fiscal def uh, deficit overshooting the target and therefore uh, you know additional borrowings being required by the government toward the end of the year so it's usually better in my mind uh, to put in a slightly more uh, conservative and achievable or uh, disinvestment number because we've seen that uh, you know uh many uh, developments uh, over the course of the year can actually uh lead to the disinvestment number coming in much lower than uh, what was uh, hoped for at the beginning of the year the second thing is that if we have ongoing schemes uh, and you know again just as a rule of thumb a uh, typical big ticket uh, uh, welfare scheme these days uh, comes at a cost of about 1 trillion per year so if you want to add 1 trillion per year then you need to be looking at 1 trillion per year coming in uh, over the uh, next uh, at least over the medium term with some kind of a modest inflation adjusted kind of increase going forward and expecting that much money to get financed year after year from disinvestment may be a tough ask so i'm not sure that uh, it's it's the right approach to think of annual disinvestment being the source of a welfare scheme uh which uh, you are going to continue over the foreseeable future this this may lead to a uh, budget math uh being uh, uh disrupted at a later point in time so i think this needs to be thought through very carefully hmm okay let me go across to rajat uh, rajat uh, this time around the bjp has to keep its alliance partners in good humor we've had uh, mr chandra babu naidu visiting delhi i think uh, two to three times now since uh, since uh, they joined the government and since the government has been formed and since he became the chief minister so uh, how is it going to pan out uh, rajat how is the bjp going to do this balancing act between prudence and keeping its alliance partners happy uh thank you for having me on your show uh first things first yes uh you know the alliance we are entering into a coalition era after almost a decade uh however uh, among all the coalition governments that india has seen over several years this remains one of the strongest coalition government uh so yes there would be certain negotiations and parleys that will happen between the uh, uh the alliance partners and the bjp uh there is still reluctance from the government to assign special statuses to individual states because that is a, a core working principle of prime minister modi that uh, no state uh, is special or every state is equally special therefore if it is a bihar or an andhra pradesh there would be more allocation of funds for specific things that were say promised uh, during uh, the bifurcation of the united andhra pradesh those uh, things have been pending for a very long time those would be addressed like a petroleum refinery uh, that was uh, promised to the uh, new state of andhra pradesh and it was languishing that has been fast forwarded and approved amravati uh, city development uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, corruption related accusations to the previous chandra babu naidu government uh, but i believe that now amravati would see a stable uh, growth towards uh, becoming a prosperous capital of andhra pradesh so all of these elbow rooms and of course uh, when it comes to uh, to bihar and up there would be and the government is already thinking that there has to be a new regime subsidy 2.0 uh, which can possibly uh, cover in certain gaps uh, or certain aspirational gaps of uh, the electorate uh, remember uh, the elections are not over in this year there are still critical elections going to happen in the states of uh, jharkhand haryana and maharashtra which might uh, 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 be pivotal to the stability of the government as well so government would be keenly watching that and ensuring that there is uh, additional layer of welfare net 
which is created through a new well thought out subsidy regime it could be a, uh, a renewed introduction of uh, uh, gas cylinder subsidies to uh, the needy which is much more directed and much more steep um, it could also entail greater subsidies around fertilizers and greater subsidies around uh, pm kisan as well government has uh, systematically lowered its subsidy as a percentage of gdp it is now at historic lows of 1.3% of the gdp the central government subsidies so it has significant elbow room to go in and also go out and double the level of subsidies and uh, meet the expectations of the electorate now uh, since it is a zero sum problem government will have to see that how much it is going to placate the middle class and how much it is going to placate the the poor and the weaker sections of our society that is the sweet balancing act which i suppose has been an intellectual exercise of the government and they are currently engaged in in ensuring that they do justice to all sections of the society right uh, rajat of course uh, a lot of uh, uh, stakeholders to pacify placate and uh, you know humor uh, my colleague gorav has a question for you gorav no rajat i just wanted to ask you one thing do you think that the government is actually the finance minister is actually going to give in uh, to the demands of a special cut category status to both uh, bihar and andhra uh, do bear in mind that if we change the category status then the uh the question arises on centrally sponsored schemes what are called as a css and who's going to bear the burden if it becomes a special category state then the burden shifts to 90 is to 10 in in you know and the center will have to bear 90% of that uh the 14 finance Com finance commission had completely done away with uh the category altogether except for northeastern and hilly states so how do you think the government is going to actually balance this because this is something that could actually trigger demands from various other states and may not just li be limited to the government's allies at this point in time rajat yeah so uh, i agree with you i think if there is one clear cut fault line in the current coalition government it is exactly this and this uh, uh, you know if you go out and extend uh, uh, a special status to the state of andhra pradesh and bihar there would be states like kerala and tamil nadu who have gone all the way to the supreme court for greater allocation of resources so the confrontation between center and the states especially the ones who are not ruled by the bjp would increase and this is where i think bjp will have to do a a, a fine balancing act to ensure that this is a deep ideological position of the bjp that no special status can be given yes there is a 16th finance commission which has been put in place under the chairmanship of arvind panagaria and if there are issues or some kind of a uh, uh, innovative uh, tool that can be created to to allocate greater resources to uh, to states like andhra pradesh and bihar but also uh, sound and look justified to the other states as well that is something which uh, would be the principal objective of the finance commission uh, which has just started its work uh, this will remain confrontationist uh, however i think uh, both nitish kumar and chandra babu naidu the two two chief ministers have been informed uh, that uh, look at more specific government allocation on the existing schemes rather than asking for a special status um, good, uh, bihar is also going to go into elections very quickly Uh, and uh, nitish kumar's public position has been that he is going to negotiate and get a special status for bihar and this is where i believe a uh, uh, lot of back and forth will have to happen in the coming months right Don't let's, expect let's it to be part mr. of the budget uh, just hold that thought rajat let me get in uh, uh, mr shivastav's thoughts in here let him uh, he, considering he's the economist here mr shivastav so you know the problem that uh, uh, ms sitaraman and the modi government faces is this to on board they've got the alliance partners on board there are demands very specific demands from them and if they were to concede to those demands it could open a pandora's box how according to you can the government navigate this they are asking for a special package they are asking for a special category status which is not possible it technically does not exist uh, for states beyond the hilly states and the northeastern states so uh, uh, in your view how do you see the budget addressing uh, the the demands that have been raised by mr chandra babu naidu and mr nitish kumar well i don't think the issue of special granting special category status would arise because that is a concept that has uh, that has gone along with the plan process however special packages can be designed for these two states or even for more states and that is a task that should be handed over to 
the Niti Ayog. Uh, I think some changes are needed in the mandate of Niti Ayog in order to look at the developmental process because the work of the Finance Commission is more focused on ensuring equalized standards of certain publicly provided and merit services like health and education. They do not go into much uh, as far as uh, developmental issues are concerned or interstate growth issues are concerned. That is something that used to be handled by the erstwhile planning commission. And Niti Aayog, uh, because it discontinued on lending uh, or giving grants to the state governments, that it was not very actively involved. But I think time has come now to give some additional uh, dimension to the scope of work of the Niti Aayog. And they should be tasked to look at the developmental issues across the states and they can design a special packages but a package is very different from a category status uh, that is something that should not be encouraged or reintroduced into the system hmm. most of the thrust will come from additional i mean in terms of available revenue resources to design these or to accommodate these special packages i think it will depend on gui's tax gdp performance uh, from a trough of something like 10% of GDP in FY20 centers, gross tax revenue has increased to 11.7% in, uh, uh, in FY, that is expected in FY25. That's a near 2 percentage point increase. That trend, if that can be maintained, many of these problems can be addressed. Hmm. Uh, let me bring in Aditi. Aditi, uh, you know, inflation. We, uh, we've heard the RBI iterate uh, that uh, inflation con continues to be their focus uh, area. Uh, in the budget, do you see that having the, 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 the fact that the inflation could, should not become, uh, come to an uncomfortable level, having a bearing on uh, the kind of incentives or the kind of uh, welfare measures that the government uh, decides to take? So, Shweta, the sense I have is that those pockets where uh, inflation has uh, seriously impinged upon uh, the consumption uh, growth and the disposable income, perhaps uh, that's where the government will try and address the revenue expenditure and the, the revenue upside that it has to be able to provide some relief. Uh, that could come in the form of uh, higher payouts under PM Kisan. It could come in the form of maybe a uh, higher wage under uh, the Narega or some, you know, tinkering with uh, the the um, personal income tax uh, threshold uh, or slabs, but I would, uh, you know, more think that it's going to come through uh, the threshold if indeed it uh, does take place. So these could be some ways to address, uh, you know, some of the inflation related concerns, uh, particularly at uh, uh, the bottom of the pyramid in terms of uh, the government being able to find, provide some offset uh, to uh, inflation and particularly food inflation, which has averaged seven and a half to eight percent for a large uh, part of uh, FI twenty four. Yeah, food inflation, Gaurav, uh, continues to be a big concern, and it will remain a very very hot topic uh, going forward. It it is it's it will continue to be a point of pain uh, not only for us but even for the government. Uh, when we, when it comes to uh, you know placating different classes, whether it's the middle class, whether it's the Ahmadmi, whether it's uh, rural India, whether it's industry, there are several levers that the government will have to uh, pull and push. Uh, what, according to you, Gaurav, are the different revenue sources that they can tap into? One is, of course, your tax revenues. That's one aspect. We've discussed disinvestment. Anything else that comes to your mind that the government can look at uh, building on this time around? So I agree with Aditi that because this is actually a very short time frame because uh, you're e effectively presenting a budget for about only eight months. Mm. In about seven months from now, uh, the finance minister will again rise to present the budget for the next year, that is FY26. So she has a very short window. Uh, so far as extra revenue sources are concerned, uh, mm. w the, uh, the RBI dividend has come in at the right time for this government. Uh, it's going to you know, suit frayed nerves in at North Block to a considerable extent because that there's an extra one lakh crore now to be deployed. Uh, now, how, how that money is going to be deployed is going, it's, go, it's going to be interesting to see because this is where the creative, creative fiscal engineering from the finance minister's side is going to be put on display during the budget. You did a story today on uh, 
possibly uh, the government actually doubling the PM Kisan scheme from 6,000 crore, uh, 6,000 to 12,000 rupees and making the payouts on a monthly basis and also a possible handout for women. women yeah. uh, uh, if that were to come through, uh, then I think a large part of the RBI dividends will probably be used for uh, funding that but the problem however with that would be that it's not a none, none of these will be a one-off scheme so while you have been able to you'll be able to fund it for this year what do you do it for next year uh, that is something that the government will have to take uh, take a serious look at because most of these uh, most of the expenditure now are anyway statutory expenditure from the government so there's very little room to, uh, uh, suddenly if you you know at in a one particular year if you go on uh, if you if you raise the welfare spending or the handout amount of one particular program, Absolutely. then it keeps on going up from every subsequent year or at, at least an, an, up, up to that amount. Mm -hmm. The government will also have to think about how to fund that over the next five or six years. Right. That is something that's going to really, really be interesting to see how finance minister goes and does that absolutely they'll have to probably double down on asset uh, monetization because they've gone so slow on it it was highlighted as one of the flagship yeah. programs of this government uh, let me uh, quickly go across to you aditi before you leave uh, your quick estimates on uh, fiscal deficit and uh, nominal and real gdp uh, growth that we can expect in this budget so, uh, Shweta, we are hoping that uh, the fiscal deficit will be eased to 4.9 or 5% of GDP. Possibly 4.9 is maybe a little optimistic on my part. 5% of GDP uh, fiscal deficit, I think, is uh, perhaps more realistic given the fact that we do expect revenue expenditure uh, to be increased. Um, on the GDP side, uh, we believe that there are transient factors that are, are dampening growth, uh, particularly in Q1 and to some extent in Q2 as well. Uh, so for the year as a whole, we are projecting uh, the GVA growth at 6.5%. Uh, and, and depending on where we end up uh, with uh, indirect taxes and subsidies, uh, that will influence uh, what the GDP growth number is. Uh, we're assuming the difference between the two will be a relatively normal 30 basis points this year. So that gives us a real GDP growth forecast of 6.8% uh, for FY25 with a subdued first half and a sharp pickup in the second half. Transient factors that are subduing the first half include the fact that government uh, capital expenditure has been low through the election months um, and we've had the overhang of a bad monsoon on the rural economy. Uh, also, commodity prices, which were a tailwind last year, are uh, no longer providing a tailwind. Uh, so margins are not going to be as comfortable this year as they were last year. So overall, 6.8% of GDP, 6.8% uh, 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 real GDP growth uh, is our forecast for FI25. All right. Thanks. Thanks for that, Aditi. And thanks so much for joining us uh, today. I know you have a pretty busy day ahead, of course. So we'll come back, get back in touch with you on the day of the budget and after the budget to see, you know, how far away from the budget were we uh, today. Thanks so much, uh, Aditi, for joining us. Uh, let me quickly now uh, bring in uh, Mr. D.K. Shivastav. Mr. Shivastav, I want to talk to you about the employment and the job situation. And that's uh, that's constantly been a point of contention um, mr modi when he was uh, uh, when he was running for elections the first time he promised jobs that was his main pole plank and over the last decade it's been a hit and a miss kind of a situation what can the budget really do to address employment or unemployment are there any specific direct measures that can be taken well, the recent CLEMS data that uh, came up uh, showed that there was some uptick in, in terms of employment, uh, but most of that employment growth was coming from agriculture. The only other sector that uh, was absorbing uh, available labor was uh, construction. And as far as the budget is concerned, any emphasis on infrastructure expansion translates to the construction sector and that uh, would continue to be employment intensive hmm. and uh, therefore as far as government's direct intervention is concerned it would probably be focused on uh, construction but uh, overall the it is the growth strategy that has to be linked to the employment strategy and hmm. the growth itself has to become more labor intensive across sectors. Now, that is a very difficult uh, challenge because most of the new technologies that are characterizing different sectors are all capital intensive 
technology intensive and not so much labor intensive and whatever labor is required is a very high skilled type so right. in terms of government policy emphasis has to be in terms of skilling and educating people providing them with the necessary skills and then expanding growth particularly focusing on outputs of those sectors that are going to be labor intensive hmm. as in the immediate term i don't see any sector other than uh construction and to some extent trade hmm. uh that is where uh, most of the employment will come from okay let me go across to rajat now rajat uh, the agnivir scheme really made headlines during elections the performance of the bjp in the state of uttar pradesh one of the reasons being cited for that loss of uh, uh, you know loss of votes in the state has been the agnivir scheme do you think there is a case for the government to, to do a rethink on the agnivir scheme and can we expect that to happen I think uh, uh, there is certainly a rethink happening uh, at the Ministry of Defence level around, uh, uh, you know, what tweaks uh, does Agnivir scheme need uh, in order to uh, make it more uh, uh, reasonable in terms of the expectations of uh, the applicants. However, uh, in the process of improving the scheme of Agnivir, they are not going to throw the baby out of the bathtub. Um, all uh, uh, state governments, uh, the CRPF and the other. Uh, uh ministry of home affairs related uh, paramilitary forces uh had been uh, you know sitting on uh, that reservation uh, that was meant for the agnivir uh, uh retirees uh, so to say but they were not implemented and i think uh, uh since the policy's intent was that there will be a major chunk which would be absorbed in these various uh, uh state government's own security uh, forces as well as the paramilitary forces of the government which did not happen and that needs to be stressed on at at first so uh you've seen various state governments like the up state government i suppose haryana state government the, these state governments which have gone on and said that we will start filling in uh, the vacancies through this uh, also uh, paramilitary forces like the crpf is also just announced that they are also going to fill in 10% through the agnivir this uh along with certain emoluments etc uh, uh, that needs to be restructured that is what the current thinking of the government is but i don't believe uh, that the core motives behind introducing the scheme uh, have changed and therefore uh, i don't see the government backtracking from agnivir at all um, whereas the other concerns uh, you know requiring the financial uh, 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 attractiveness of this whole scheme that can uh, certainly be played with and uh, uh, government will ensure that uh, various stakeholders are heard well on this and this uh, job scenario goes on and this is one of the principal reasons why disinvestment will take a back stage because uh, jobs and jobs in psu sectors and also in defense uh, establishment uh, remains an important uh, metric for also allocation of reservation benefits so if uh, uh, if the government jobs c and d grade jobs and the psu jobs uh, start uh, freezing uh, and more contractual jobs are uh, are put in place instead of full time jobs this tends to have a direct impact on reservation and this is one of the reasons that uh, government uh you know would be very very careful uh, that any kind of uh, de facto removal of uh, of reservation benefits uh, have written them and it would want uh, not to repeat that mistake in the coming days all right okay thank you very much uh, for that rajat and thank you very much uh, mr shivastav for joining us to really uh, lay down for us the key economic priorities for the government the pulls and pressures it is going to be a tight rope walk uh, for this government as it as it presents its uh, first budget as uh, uh, in a and in, with a very challenging backdrop right after general elections and with state elections going forward thank you very much uh, to rajat and uh, mr shivastav for sharing their perspective now i have with me uh, mr vinayak chatterji of uh, infravision mr chatterji is uh, the infrastructure man after mr gadkari of course uh, in the country if there's somebody who understands the execution of infrastructure the vision of infrastructure and the multiplier impact of infrastructure it's uh, mr vinayak chatterjee thank you very much uh, for joining us uh, good to see you after a very long time we've been yes. talking about uh, 
we've been uh, talking about the impact the the budget imperatives and the impact of infrastructure specifically in job creation jobs has been a huge sore point for this government not only this government even the previous governments it's been uh, it's been an uphill battle for india as a country and infrastructure is seen as one of the areas that can really uh, play a big part in solving that puzzle uh, mr uh, mr chatterjee just want to begin by getting your thoughts in on what are you expecting uh, from uh, this budget when it comes to the infrastructure sector and what according to you should be done in terms of allocation so uh Thank you. It's a pleasure speaking to you after a long time. I must say we have been interacting for almost over two to three decades. I think I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, right, you asked the right question. Let's step back and look at what the infrastructure outlay means for the budget, for the economy, and for jobs. Basically, that's the question you're asking. And for that, we have to take a look at the quantum of outlays that should be presented in the budget. now you know the uh, after the budget was announced last year the full budget i'm not talking about the interim budget there was an interaction with the top honchos the top bureaucrats of the finance ministry they are all known by name and they did share publicly the fact that there was a confidential document in the finance ministry which shaped their thinking which is that 1 rupee spent on public work stroke infrastructure resulted in 3 rupees of gdp whereas 1 rupee uh made available through the uh, direct dbt route direct benefit transfer route resulted in 90 paisa of gdp now you can clearly understand what the impact of infrastructure is on gdp every 1 rupee results in 3 vis-a-vis some other schemes now in a situation where private capex is still not picking up to the extent as was desired or as was expected it is very clear that public outlays and infrastructure outlays are going to play and continue to play a very very important role on gdp growth right we will come to employment now if you see the last few years this government has been pretty consistent in its economic philosophy that public expenditure will be used to pump prime gdp growth and therefore year after year you have consistently had outlays ranging from 25% increase to 30% increases in the budget 7.5 lakh crores became 10 lakh crores in the full budget last year i am discounting the interim budget because i think that was merely a holding operation so the last full year budget had 10 lakh crores of infra budget outlay mm-hmm. my yeah. my expectation or my desire is to see a 13 lakh crore outlay a 30% increase because there is the maths is very clear mm-hmm. if you do mm-hmm. not have this 30% constant increase in budgetary outlays for infrastructure mm-hmm. you may not see 8% gdp growth because it is this level of outlay that is pump priming the economy there is another thumb rule that public works and central government outlays mm-hmm. lead mm-hmm. other infrastructure investments okay so the thumb rule in the sector is that if the central government spends 10 then another equivalent 10 is spent spent by three other constituents all the states put together ebr extra budgetary resources and yeah. private capex all these three together add up to the same amount as the central government outlay so if the central government ends up spending 30 or provides an outlay of 13 lakh crores then the total infrastructure spent in the country will be about 26 to 27 lakh crores this is the expectation that would be the minimum required to pump prime the economy to deliver an 8% gdp growth and since you know that infrastructure and is largely construction driven and construction has a multiplier of 6 in terms of multipliers and job creation mm. uh, it will naturally lead to another burst of job creation but let me stop here to say that after all this macroeconomics is done and, and dusted yeah. mm. the big bullet point for expectations from this year's budget is that compared to the last full year budget this new full year budget will have an infrastructure outlay of 13 lakh crores over to you all right let me uh, just bring in my colleague gorav also here gorav uh, you, you have a question for mr chatterjee yeah, yeah yeah mr chatterjee thank you for joining us i had one question uh, particularly on the capital expenditure and you rightly alluded to the fact that the government has been doing the heavy lifting 
on capital expenditure. This has been particularly pronounced since 2021 and we have seen how it has grown right up to 11.1 lakh crore of the total uh, in, in the last interim budget. Uh, but one of the assumptions of uh, this heavy lifting by the government has also been that you know this public uh, heavy lifting of capital expenditure is eventually going to crowd in private capital expenditure to a private investment too. Uh, data, however, suggests that has been a little sluggish on that front. Why do you think the crowding in phenomenon hasn't taken place in the private sector as yet? And when do you think it's going to take place? Look, crowding in happens at two levels. One, it happens at the level when government announces a slew of PPP projects where private capital invests. You have seen in the past that private capital has invested in ports, it has invested in airports, it has invested in transmission, and it has invested in green energy and related matters like storage, etc. These are the big areas where private capital has invested. Uh, but the broad picture is that the government, the PPP flavor that had peaked at uh, around 37% around the 12th plan period has come down to levels of 15, 20% in spite of all of this. So PPP has not happened, which is sucked has not happened to the extent desirable for various reasons which we have discussed over the last decade. And therefore, from 2014 onwards, the government has responded to EPC as the dominant form of infrastructure development. Now, in EPC, what happens is you create a multiplier effect for intermediate goods and services. Like you will have an increased demand for cement. You will have an increased demand for bitumen. You will have an increased demand for construction equipment. So the EPC or the public expenditure creates so, yeah, precisely the, the point he's trying to uh, the, the the additionality and the demand for intermediates and that has not been too bad huh? by the way if you see much of the demand in the electrical sector cables transformers um, cement etc in the in the construction sector that intermediate demand has happened with government expenditure crowding in the demand for intermediate goods and services what has not happened is the PPP component, which for almost a decade now has been uh, barring a few sectors and a few uh, illustrative examples, has not been as robust as in the past. So it is the interplay of these two components which broadly answer your question. Right, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, very quickly, you know, I want to get a sense from you. So the government has been pushing uh, 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 infrastructure creation. There has been a lot of focus. Uh, now, at this point, while you've said that we need to see a 30% increase in allocation, uh, why is it that we've not been able to see the spillover effect as quickly in terms of job creation? Because, again, this has been one of the sectors where uh, it's said that it is, it's, it's a job creator. But the, the turnaround has not kept up. Is it because there's increased mechanization in this space? which is why we have not seen uh, the spillover effect on creating employment uh, as uh, as fast as one would have hoped. Look, job cre the, the dissection of analysis of job creation is a complex subject. Hmm. But the fact that large public outlays, l let's look at where we agree. I think there is universal agreement among economists and analysts that the large public investments have led to pump prime the economy to get GDP moving at 75 to 8%, right? Now, right. GDP growth at 75 8% cannot be jobless growth. So the question is, the pump priming of infrastructure has certainly led to uh, job increases in the infrastructure sector. That the, the LNT chairman is talking about uh, a shortage of uh, workers on site. Hmm. So the, uh, if you see the, the sales of construction equipment like JCBs, if you see cement sales, all of these sales reflect the fact that somebody is using these products and there are armies of people working on these. So construct right. infrastructure outlays and construction has created the jobs that it was supposed to. What you have to now dissect is whether other large job creating sectors like IT, which has seen flat job creation or manufacturing, where it has not seen great growth and, and job creation. There you have to do a greater degree of soul searching to say why those haven't happened. But to... Mm. But to posit that public expenditure and infrastructure outlays have not created sufficient jobs is not the right argument. Okay. All right. Um, when it comes to the states, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, going forward, uh, 
in terms of focus areas anything that the budget can do to incentivize states further and uh, uh, you know to, to further to to add to this whole infrastructure capex creation story the uh, uh, full year budget last year and before that created a significant incentive package for states i forget the exact figures but i do remember that it was 50 year money at concessional interest for states that submitted projects in specific areas now that's as big as incentive as you can get but let me move to another budget expectation which is to say that uh, that there is a lot of talk about crumbling infrastructure in our cities city infrastructure financing has reached levels which are almost close to making cities dysfunctional if you see the traffic if you see how waste is managed Absolutely. if you see urban transport if you see urban housing so there is a crying need for the budget now after 2 3 years of talking about capacity building in municipal uh, corporations and urban local bodies my expectation is finally that this year's budget should attempt to bite the bullet and targetize the raising of at least 20000 crores of municipal bonds so that the central government provides an assistance and 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 an incentive package whether it is 10% participation in the in the uh, issues of municipal bonds whether it is credit guarantees whether it is credit enhancement but i am looking forward to and this answers your question as to how the center can help the states because the ulbs and municipal corporations are uh, are sons and daughters of the state you know mm -hmm. so the incentive package which was announced last year need to be extended municipal bonds for city financing need to be given a very aggressive push and there are many projects where the state government shares 50 50 with the state government for example all metro projects the central government takes 50% equity and the state government takes 50% equity so these are areas in which the central government helps states fiscally to mm -hmm. do their infrastructure but it i must place on record that many states have shown huge degree of positivism and aggression states like maharashtra up tamil nadu hmm have actually built at great speed and quality expressways and right. uh, public transportation and irrigation etc so hmm. all of this needs to be encouraged by the center over okay. back to you right my last question to you mr chatterjee is that uh, in this budget do we expect the center to uh, move more aggressively in terms of monetization of their uh, roads and highways projects do we see that happening <laughs> you have touched on a raw nerve i think so far as the government is concerned you know year after year the we have failed on the combination of meeting what is called disinvestment targets stroke privatization targets stroke monetization targets so monetization is the broad umbrella word the i think the government has to do very serious rethink on how it manages the process because year after year it says that <clears throat> we have missed the target even now the national monetization plan has succeeded only because of the successes in the highway sector in monetizing brownfield assets and funnily enough in it has made a lot of money on the coal bids hmm a big sector that was supposed to monetize railways has not shown an iota of performance uh, large portions of monetization of uh, you know central and state utilities whether they were transmission assets or power plants or bus terminals or railway land etc has not happened so it's a very big question mark saying that history has shown that mayor budget announcements on monetization stroke disinvestment stroke privatization yeah. have year after year not given the results so it is about completely different view as to how we would like to manage this process All right thank you so much uh, for that uh, very very candid and very insightful assessment uh, Mr Chatterjee much appreciated and of course uh, we'll have the union budget in just a few days from now and uh, let's hope that the budget actually takes the india story forward in every which way a big thank you to all our panelists who joined us today and uh, thank you Gaurav for uh, coming down to our studios and giving us uh, your insights thank you so much thank you so much Veta Thanks so much for watching and uh, do keep uh, tracking money control for all news updates and analysis.